Hello. Let's just wait for some people to join the live. Great. Hi, everyone. Everyone who's joining. Hello. Welcome. So let's get started. All right. Okay. Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Isabel Kent. I am an art historian. And today I have the great honour of and privilege of speaking with Sir Simon Sharma uh, for the Kolnagi Foundation. This is the fifth in our series of live interviews where I speak to artists and thinkers whose work looks at the great art of the past and reinterprets it for our modern age. And I cannot think of a better person to speak to than Simon Sharma. So, how to introduce Sharma? He is one of the best known and most influential historians of our age. Uh, he's a professor of history and history of art at Columbia University, a columnist for the FT, uh, a regular for the New Yorker, and a writer and presenter of numerous documentaries and, um, and radio shows. He has written on everything from the French Revolution, the Dutch Republic, the slave trade and the entire history of Britain um, to modern politics and food, which are some of his other great passions. Like many of you, I grew up watching Sharma's documentaries uh, on the small screen from Landscape and Memory to The Power of Art and the Story of the Jews. And today uh, we are going to be discussing his most recent series, um, currently airing on BBC Two, The Romantics and Us. This is a three-part series, and it's a fascinating look at how the Romantics, their writing, their art, um, their music and ideas shaped our modern age. So I'm so excited uh, to be speaking with Simon about this. So. Without further ado, let's try and add him to the chat. All right. Let's see. Just waiting for a connection. Hello. Okay. Hi. Here I am. Hi, Simon. Hello, is he? Right, here I am. How let are me, you? Let me move. Um, there we go. Yeah, that's a bit yep, better. Sure position. Right. Position perfectly. Beautiful backdrop. Right, right. here I am. Uh, where, where, where in the world are you right now? Um, still hunkered down in the Lower Hudson Valley in Westchester. Yeah. So mm -hmm. where we've been for six months. Goodness. The only, almost one of the few outings we've had is, of course, an art expedition to Storm King Sculpture Park, which is a wonderful place. And I, I wrote I wrote a piece, one of the, thank you for mentioning the FT Collins, I wrote a piece um, about Storm King, which is um, essentially a place for contemporary sculpture, but it's, um, it's uh, about an hour, I suppose it's about two hours north drive from New York, perched on a hill um above the hudson river oh, and um it was, it was originally it was originally called butter hill um <laughs> which speaks to the <laughs> relatively prosaic imagination of the dutch settlers who yeah. were farming around here and it's a story about romantics a romantic writer who was a journalist and wrote about art decided given the spectacular scenery of the hudson valley which of course was the kind of cradle of american yeah. landscape painting it should be called something yeah. other than Butter Hill, and, and uh, there is this effect you get on that west bank of the of the Hudson Highlands um, of so it was thought whether romantic fantasy or not of clouds coming down during the course of the morning that was supposed mm -hmm. to prophesy a storm in the afternoon. So it was a kind of metals. A guy who made manufactured metal clips who owned this property and was um, won over. Um, and he started buying David Smith sculptures. He started buying David Smith. He went to David Smith's studio on Lake George. So we're in about 1957, I think. I don't know how you feel about David Smith. I love David Smith. And uh, he bought 13 on the spot. 
and built Great. yeah and he built the park around them it was originally meant to be a museum for his hudson river landscapes and then he changed mm -hmm. his mind and that's full of wonderful staff of um, great richard sarah wonderful andy goldsworthy undulating wall incredible mm -hmm. there's a lovely kiki smith right now so once yeah. it opened you know i thought okay life you gotta go Life is art, isn't yeah. it? And art is life. Well, you and me both, because uh, yeah. similar, last week I was driving down from Yorkshire and stopped off at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, which sounds like oh. a similar, you know, the, breathtaking that, that views, its rolling present, hills. Actually. Um, I think the Yorkshire Sculpture Park is slightly older than Storm King. It's much older than yeah. we think. I, I think it sort of fell into a kind of picturesque slumber, dare I say, for a bit. But of course, it's unbelievably wonderful place. And, yeah, and... Yeah. and and it was packed when I went. I, I thought, you know, this is nice. I get some art outside. Everything will be spot. spread out. Did you I, not have I to book your I thankfully just, you know, booked as I was driving in. But you did need to book in advance. I just didn't realise that. Yeah. Then the wonderful people at the gate were so were so kind to just sort of let me yeah. sit there in the car and book while I was while I was the, getting in. The but third it's place, fantastic. which people people who are logged on should know about, because it's actually much more less well known, I suspect, is the Kroner Müller museum on the border in Arnhem in the Netherlands, South Netherlands, on the border between Holland and Germany. And that itself is historic. Yeah. So it was designed after the First World War to be a place through art of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Crowley or Mrs. Muller, who were married, can't remember which name was which, had an incredible collection of Van Gogh's, Van Gogh, as we yeah. um, don't correctly say in <laughs> England. And the biggest um, next to the Van Gogh Museum, um, but it, it very quickly developed, well, maybe not very quickly, again, into a wonderful sculpture park, essentially of classical modernist sculpture. Mm. So Barbara Hepworth, Epstein, Henry yeah. Moore. Um, but it's, it's art. Mm. It, but it's really, really wonderful, actually. Brent yeah, Lucy. I know we're going, we're going so off topic, but I, I love, we are, love well, that but this period is all good, of just post-war. No, I mean, art exactly. Talks. But that, yeah. that, that period of post-war where sculpture sort of took on this form of, you know, reconciliation of public... Yeah. Uh, space and you know public space, yeah. all of the sort of Battersea Park uh, exhibitions that were held after the Second World yeah. War. Yeah, well, it's you and I will do. You and I will even further off topic now, which is a good thing. <laughs> you and I will do one thing. I felt that's really not been done properly is is a big show. Uh, you know, it should be a, a, a Tate Britain probably, but one of the Tates on the fifties. You know, the fifties is thought yeah. to be so dowdy and traditional and tweed jacketed and um, all those people who are rightly forgotten like Graham mm. Sutherland they're not rightly forgotten and it was absolutely you know fizzing with bravery with yeah. um, the independent group you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, and Henry Moore the father of them all you know as, as yeah. he yeah. describes um, he has a beautiful sculpture at Storm King actually it's it's close to the museum yes. and it is it's called mm, I mean, it's it's called enclosed figures, and it's one of these kind of uh, oh, prone mothers, yeah. yeah, with a kind of womb space with yeah. a child, sort of post-fetal womb child yeah. inside, and it's it's just sort of like an arabesque um, loop, you know, it's yeah. very beautiful and, you know, and, and very post-war that sort of protection. Uh, exactly. Field. There was it's... a whole exhibition again. We're meant to be talking about the romantics, okay. but yeah, but that, more that's for a second. We've already created a, an important, yeah. new spectacular show. Yeah. So. <laughs> did, did you see the exhibition at the, at the Wallace Collection, which for anyone who doesn't know, I used to work at the Wallace, and there was an exhibition there of the, the Helmet Head series. Those, um, oh, no, those, I didn't. And, I didn't. and it's the first time that this, this series that he worked on for quite over a number of yeah. Um, a sort of large portion of his life yeah. were all collected together and you know seen as this yeah this yeah. protective armor yeah uh, anyway. that's lovely yeah that sounds fantastic well when i can finally travel again i'll need to, need to yeah to the sculpture park right um, yeah right. but it, it sounds, sounds extraordinary okay <laughs> what a wonderful prologue um <laughs> and actually i i <laughs> It's so interesting you, you mentioned the, the, the Hudson Valley and the Hudson Valley School and everything because something that's, that's missing from the romantics, I wanted to ask you this later, but because it goes on so perfectly, something that, that you don't talk about is the, is the American romanticism and, and, you know, nature and things like that. Oh, I wonder, really? did you ever think to, that you wanted to maybe include that? 
I, indeed, I did. We we were. Um, I stamped my foot and threw a major tantrum at the direction of the BBC, which does nobody any good at all. Wanting four programmes, and um, the fourth programme would actually have been about Spate Romanticism. It would have been about late Romanticism, particularly about music, because music has a much longer mm -hmm. formal Romantic life, at least in the nineteenth century. You know, with Mahler and and so on. So then I, I, that was all going to be about natural impulse. And in fact, we do talk about nature, but not, you know, not so we don't concentrate it enough at the end of program two. And I do a number mm. on, you know, the Tintin Abbey on Wordsworth's incredible poem. And uh, uh, I have a talk, a wonderful talk with David Attenborough, actually, and he reads some Wordsworth, we kind of read the poem together. And that, that's lovely. So we don't we don't ignore it entirely. But it was mm. one of those, you know, brutal things that happen in television. And you decide you have to make kill your darlings decisions. But yeah. uh, and I've, I've written a bit about uh, the Hudson, you know, River School. I oh. hope there'll be some opportunities to talk more about that. And um, mm. in in um, in uh, the I'm trying to think actually which. Oh, yes. In the program on landscape um, in in civilizations. Um, David Olashoka did the 19th century program and he did the Hudson River School quite well, very well, in fact. Mm, and yeah. I also talked about Winslow Homer, you know, who's a real passion of mine. I don't know, he's one of those people who, you know, chronologically seems to be lodged in the kind of realist chronological slot. You mm. know, one thing that this program tries to do is kind of explode the encapsulation of isms one after the other. But I, you know, Winslow Homer has a huge amount of <laughs> late romantic <coughs> sensationalism, by which I mean yeah. the kind of trying to register the effect of the senses. Um, yeah. And um, I, di I did a number in the, in the program on, on um, landscape and the pastoral, I don't know if you saw it called, um, uh, what's it called? Um, a veteran in a new field. Do you know that painting? Okay. I don't. Oh, it's an amazing Winslow Homer. One always thinks of his sea okay. paintings, but it's literally someone who's come back from the Civil War and his Union uniform um, is at his feet. And it's very close up. There's no, unlike landscape, uh, the window effect is, I mean, it, it's it's Caravaggio-like and it's, it's complete evaporation mm. of breathing space. So he's utterly in our face and he's wielding this enormous scythe and this endless golden field of wheat, very American, mm. is starting to be cut down before the scythe. And it, it, as I speak about it, it's a kind of ponderously literal emblem for the slaughter of the Civil War. Yeah. But it's also extremely moving because um, it was painted as a response to Lincoln's assassination. And so like all the great, you know, romantic, it's another piece of romantically, politically engaged art. So it's a kind of memorial piece really in the way that, yeah. you know, we instantly think of the romantics oh. dealing with, yeah. Yeah, so let's get, let's get to the beginning of what we right. should talk about, which is this series, uh, introducing it. And, and what, what I really want to start with is why, did you want to expand on this thesis, this thesis of, you know, how the romantics relate to our modern age? Mm. Why right now? Because you've worked on yeah. this period of history from your earliest career. You know, what yeah. was that moment in time that made this the story you wanted to yeah. tell? Well, it was an offshoot really of um, um, uh, something I'm writing about nationalism, which, you know, who isn't writing about that now, um, but which may or may not end up being called what it is called, provisionally called Return of the Tribes. And, um, you know, a bit like Monsieur Jordan waking up one day in, in the bourgeois gentilhomme discovering that he's been speaking prose all his life. There was a, there was a moment when I realized for whatever reason, or so many of the things I've done over, you know, many, many decades have been about allegiance, really. And have been particularly about the relationship between allegiance and, if you like, landscape. So in some ways, you know, the book I wrote about the Dutch the embarrassment mm. of riches began mm. with a kind of psychology of geography, really, about their their, their consciousness very early on. Control water, century. yeah. Exactly, exactly, about 
um, living in a non-Edenic world, not in the Paradise Garden like the rest mm -hmm. of, you know, Christianity, um, but quite the opposite, some a, a kind of ordeal. This is way before, you know, Calvinist theology of trials and so on. And so, you know, when I wrote about the French Revolution, which seems on the face of it, and is in lots of ways, a very radically different thing, the one thing that struck me that was a kind of ferocious drive of both the good and the bad parts of the French Revolution was a sense that France had become a nation, you know, and as a, a, it was a sort of mystique of territory in a way, because it's when, it's only when the Prussians and the Austrians physically cross the frontiers of the newborn republic at the, in the autumn of 1792, that a kind of, you know, spasm of patriotic terror and determination takes place. And so mm. the link really between this sort of discovery of what it means to be, I mean, the, the, the uh, I always remember that actually, but I'd forgotten until we're having this talk, uh, it, the, the, the threatening phrase which, uh, which a member of the revolutionary police would use as someone they suspected of being a, an emigre or disloyal to the government would be, êtes-vous de la nation? Do you belong to the nation? And um, it's sort of both exhilarating and scary at the same time. And, you know, lots of other things too. The Jewish history and the American future has really all been about that. Yeah. So I, that what place. Do, yeah, yeah, what I'm trying to do is it, in the book is really, it's not a book purely about the romantics. So it may change a bit, but it really is about, again, the collective psychology of what it means to belong. So there's a chapter on music, chapter on sports, chapter on art for sure so it's really about almost kind of ethnology of of ethnology the sort of mythologies yeah. of defeat so really when i when i thought about how that kind of sense of belonging came to be it's utterly a property of the romantic movement because of the romantics belief starting with rousseau um that nature is everything you know yeah. and um and you know, uh, etymologically, natio is cognate with nativity and birth. And yeah. so the, everything about the place or the home you were you were born in, um, you know, controls everything else. So that had me reading um, the romantics a lot, sort of drenching myself. And then mm -hmm. then I thought of, well, it be, might be a very nice thing to expand that obsession into other obsessions. Watching, for example... The demonstrations in Hong Kong, mm. you know, really a sort of belief in people power, which now, who knows, maybe, you know, yeah, irreversibly but... trodden on. That made me think of the Mask of Anarchy, yeah, and um, you know, Black Lives Matter. I mean, in that little sequence at the end of the first program, mm. um, you know, when Chris Eccleston very movingly reads that passage about, um, oh stand ye still like a forest still and mute you know crossed arms and resolute i mean that was and then we have pictures of of um i think it was civil rights demonstrators with martin luther king on the bridge at selma yeah, literally with like... literally yeah. with crossed arms yeah. and so so the wiring you know every we were brought up in the 1960s as history undergraduates never to commit the sin of what was then called presentism in other words don't don't overly project what you're looking at, uh, what, how you feel about the present and project mm -hmm. it crudely in the reductionist way on the past. Uh, so we were conscious throughout the series of nearly not being crude about it. But, you know, when you when you look to something like Mask of Anarchy or when, for example, a lot of people might think this is crazy. But when I looked at Blake's great allegorical drawings of Orc and Horizon, you think mm -hmm. superheroes and comic books. And that seemed to me not a stretch you know at all yeah it seemed to me absolutely where that starts so, yeah so it came came out of that the contemporaneously the romantics you know jumping out of their allotted time slot between neoclassicism and realism you know it's the curse of art history textbooks yeah. um, seemed to be you know not a presentist thing to do but to sort of try and illuminate a real truth about them yeah, and, and I think that definitely comes across. I mean, it's not like you're sort of just taking something from the past and sort of like planting it in the modern day. Right. What, what I felt from the series very strongly is that you give 
the history it's time to breathe you know you you give yeah. history that you, you don't you don't try and cram in you know 12 stories in one episode you no we we, we were again we had 12 stories of course actually yeah, of course so, uh, as that's our way of we being you know hugo uh, mcgregor the genius director i've worked with a lot mm -hmm. now and um, you, you go out trawling for possible stories and you come back with far more than you can use. And we took a decision very early on. I mean, we kept on winnowing things down. We took a decision very early on, exactly as you say, that things go wrong when you try and do a survey, when you, because it ends up mm -hmm. with a kind of drive through, sort of barely more than a shout out, you know. Um, and there are losses in that. We would have liked, and the one on dreams and nightmares and the chambers of the mind, the one that's going to be broadcast on Friday, you know, originally we really did want to do a much longer number on Fuseli, who does have simply a yeah. kind of shout out and an image of the nightmare. But it's it, a, a, a lot of people have been very kind enough to say that exactly as you've just said, that because we absolutely have any four or five stories, you know, we can stay with them for 10 mm -hmm. minutes or so, which is an age on, on television, you know. Yeah, and it's something that, you know, I don't see very often in documentaries anymore you know you, you that that um the time spent and the depth to which you know yeah. with that, a lot of time you're able to go into something yeah. rather than just you know the wave of oh you know his fuseli his his delacroix his jericho whoever it might be yeah it, it does feel like you're you know taking the time to delve into them and also you know something that that struck me is you're you're looking at these figures like shelley like blake you know these figures that if you're british you studied in school but you're looking at aspects of them that I think people won't be familiar with or won't necessarily be as intimately familiar with. So, for example, right. you know, with Shelley, we all studied Ozymandias, but we didn't all right. study The Mask of Anarchy in school. Right, right. And, exactly. you know, with um, Caspar David Friedrich, you're not talking right. about The Wanderer, you know. But yeah. You, you pick up, I mean, that's actually one I'd like you to talk about more is, you know, absolutely sure. The, sure. the way that you look at Caspar David Friedrich, which I think is, is really fantastic. So actually, yeah, could you handing over to you? Could you say a bit more about? Well, about... I, you, yeah, I mean, you know, Friedrich is so important in so many ways because he does formally do extraordinary things, you know, with the hook there, the figure seen from behind. And actually mm -hmm. the, 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 the painting that we choose um, to look at in intense detail. It's called the Abbey in the Oakwoods. I'll, I'll say a bit more about that in a second. But I just wanted to say, apropos of the point you've made, is when you go to the gallery in Berlin, there are these two great masterpieces, not huge at all. Um, the other one is The Monk by the Sea, which is much, much better known, which yeah. has a, this sort of almost silhouetted figure with this enormous oceanic space. So there is this kind of uh, very important side of the Romantics, this sort of um, hybrid between scientific observation and mystical communion, which mm. is utterly Friedrich. But when I wrote Landscape and Memory, um, the, 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 one of the most important paintings, which I was finally able to deal with in, in detail in, in this film, apart from the Abbey in the Oakwoods, is the, the sort of chasseur in the woods. And yeah. because there's a big, you know, a huge section about the German historical psychology about or the, the, the origins of the Teutonic races in the primeval forest. And um, the tendency is to think of, again, Caspar W. Friedrich sort of changing what painting is or what it can do <coughs> with space and light and so on. And that's absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely correct. You don't often think of him, really, as a kind of warrior figure. And I'm not saying a, a German mm -hmm. patriotic warrior is ultimately the most important thing. We should, you know, he's... Um, um, he, he's not a philosopher like Herder or a polemicist like Fichte, um, and he's not a kind of, you know, a wonderful melange of uh, enlightenment, classicism and romantic impulse like Goethe. Um, but he, he cared deeply, and that was why we ended up with his letters. I mean, there's this extraordinary letter to his brother, um, who was... Um, you know, working at the time of the Napoleonic Empire, which, which since they, they demolished the armed forces of Prussia in particular, was a time of maximum um, humiliation for anyone who felt themselves emotionally to be German. And his brother is working in Lyon, and Caspar de Friedrich says the most kind of brutal thing to him. He says, well, you've obviously, in a sense, betrayed the German nation and your own identity 
and I have to ask you not to get in touch with me ever again until you basically leave France. And so he's, um, you know, a part of his temperament is this, because artists, I think, you know, they're, they're not born as politicians or they're, they're, they don't have this, uh, you know, they, they come sideways to it in a way in which, you know, Goya, you know, is prepared to paint everybody's portrait, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's no good presenting Goya as an absolutely, utterly committed champion of the Enlightenment. Part of him is, but it's not doesn't rule out painting the horrible royal family or the vile Godoy or the yeah. monstrous tyrant Ferdinand VII. But, you know, when everything blows up in his face, in when the Madrienos rise in, in May 1808, he, uh, which he does not witness, he paints something as though he'd witnessed it with mm -hmm. the kind of figure being shot by a firing squad as a kind of reborn Jesus. Yes, and similarly, you know, Picasso, who I think had this kind of communion with Goya's shiftiness, oddly enough, couldn't care less about politics, really, until he, in fact, you know, there have been suggestions that the first time he goes back to Spain, I think it's 1934, He's even flirting with some more right-wing ideology, but he's pulled mm. back into it by the Civil War, by um, by Sartre and others. And um, and when he jumps, he jumps and makes Guernica. So I think the same with Friedrich. Then that you know Friedrich, once he decides that there is something tinny and hollow, that there is something awful about sort of the bureaucratic despotism of Napoleon, that mm. the, he then, you know, the inner fires of, of what romanticism should do kind of stir within him. And there is a, a crucial element in all romantic feeling, which is not necessarily a healthy one, is what I call the romance of defeat. You know, sort of sense of tearing open the wound, ripping off the scab, really letting it all bleed so that you really feel the sorrow. Uh, that was very much part of what he is doing too. And the, mm -hmm. the Abbey in the Oakwoods, which is a place called Eldona, which is the ruins, the Gothic ruins of an abbey, which his father took him to north near um, near Hooken Island. Um, and, uh, you know, the, again, the sense of actually childhood and nationality being kind of braided together. So this is, this is a ruin um, at extreme point where dusk becomes darkness and there's this kind of gothic funeral going on or rather a yeah. coffin is being carried by almost caricaturally shrouded monks into the ruins it's and it's an extraordinary achievement actually to get exactly and, and i spent ages and i'm not sure i got it right color grading that particular bit of the film actually to to, to really be faithful to his sense mm. of getting this crepuscular ultimate edge of twilight. It's a kind of scrim of light, really, mm. that he does. It's sort of not, has no color in it, it's kind of gray, browny thing. And yeah. these mad anthropomorphized bear. The trees, they reminded trees. me of Nash. You know, Paul trees. Nash is kind of. Bombed yeah. out trees as have well. you seen the painting? Have you seen the painting in I, Berlin? I haven't. I, I now no. need to next next flight Good. I get to, to Good. Berlin. But, it's uh, it's really wonderful. And then there are all the tip offs, you know that yeah. um, that that it's a it's a crescent moon, not a, wa a waxing moon, new moon, and tiny little buds. I thought, oh, I'm imagining this, you know. And then the one thing wonderful about filming art is that there's no one else around we were doing yeah. early in the morning and I think actually we were lucky it was a museum was shut then and sure enough that each of the branches you know had this kind of half millimeter um you know he's obviously got a squirrel but, brush yeah. and he's gone dunk yeah to yeah. suggest the the budding that will happen yeah no, it's amazing. And, and I will say, you know, you're talking about the, the colour grading and trying to get that to come across on the screen. One thing that the, the series does do is have that physicality. I mean, you were just talking, you know, about... You. So, so about the buds, you know, you can see them with those close-ups. Yeah. Um, it's, it's episode three, isn't it, that is Casper David Creech? It's in yeah. episode three. It's um, in, in the episode and, is called Tribes, yeah. Yeah. And the, um, and the other physicality, you're talking about uh, Friedrich's letters. You... Yeah. 
there's so much archive in this. I mean, looking at the yeah. handwriting of, you know, De Quincey yeah. and looking at the handwriting yeah. of Friedrich and, you know, seeing these archive documents that, you know, as academics, I'll read countless letters that have been previously published and they're in yeah. normal type and everything, but you don't get that kind of the scroll. And, and I think you bring that to life really wonderfully, that immediacy, the, the, the way that you react it's, it's what, to, you know, to having these, you know, draw, yeah, you know scrolls in front of you. And art, yeah, sorry, sorry. Easy. No, it's what artists and art historians from them call. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a, a cliche word of our trade, but it's a good word, the mark. You know, the mark really, really matters, actually. Yeah. I mean, I find that there's an old fountain pen that I work <laughs> with, this one, among others. Um, the other I get, and I suppose it is a fuddy-duddy thing, um, the more... I can feel the actual physical force of the pen on the paper. Um, mm -hmm. The fresher the ideas are going to be. It's really weird. Of course, like everybody else, it you know gets transferred to the kind of screen that we're looking at now. But there is so so I, I, I yeah I do I do look at these things. I mean, you you mentioned the mask of anarchy, um, and um, yeah, it was quite clear that Shelley, who's in Italy and has got a bit a bit of a guilty conscience about being there while Lee Hunt is sending him these terrible newspaper reports of Peterloo. So there's a sense of making a poem, you know, even in this mm -hmm. kind of tempest of rage that he has about the Peterloo massacre. So actually the hand itself is, is elegant to begin with. And then as he goes on and these incredible kind of boot stomping quatrains take over this kind of musical force, yeah. you know, he's just pressing, he's pressing yeah. the nib on the, and I love, you know, the Victor Hugo drawings in, in Programme 2, uh, which are, you know, uh, some of them are what we would now call automatic drawings, where he's actually not looking mm -hmm. at, at the page. But they were so conscious of the physicality of the materials. Again, a mm -hmm. startlingly, startlingly modern thing. So that he, did, he uses what is already an anachronistic way of writing a goose quill and then he mutilates the quill deliberately so that his yeah. slots the only person i can think of you know leonardo wrote about the accidental um the kind of you know accidental associations you get from looking at lichen and rust and mm -hmm. mold and so on but the only artist um relatively modern artist who really is a kind of pre rorschach block artist is Alexander Cousins. And if you know him, who was a, a yeah. teacher at Eton and who does these extraordinary primitive blots, which then translate into mountain landscape. His son, John Robert Cousins, is, is a truly great British artist, I think, actually, and a watercolorist, but he's a, absolutely an artist of dreams and impulse. So, um, De Quincey, the opium eater, the kind of drug memoirist, who also appears in, in two, again, has an astonishing manuscript. And it's all full of not laudanum, as I was rather hoping, coffee stains. So he's kind of just throwing coffee. Yeah, I thought that was stage. amazing, seeing the coffee stain good? down the side of the Isn't page. But he's, you know, he's thinking, a great you know, underliner. Yeah, he's yeah. a great underliner. And he edits on page. And when you when you look at the manuscripts, and you're so right about, you know, us being when you see a published primary source, mm. even if it has things that are crossed out, you kind of you just sort yeah. of go past <laughs> it. Whereas you see the raw, the raw thing, um, you can feel the kind of, you know, uh, new judgment, the kind of honesty and uh, strength yeah. of of a, a, and a the rhythm look of how it's been written, you know, you can see which which yeah. bit a, a, a writer has rushed over and tried to scroll out before yeah. it leaves their head, and which bit that they yeah. really pondered over and sort of paused. No, I, I, mean, it's, I, it, yeah. I wish people would go to, um, I don't know where, I suppose British Library must do this really quite mm. well. I, I was so struck, the Morgan Library here in New York does wonderful at tiny exhibitions where mm. manuscripts are shown. And one of the most amazing ones a couple of years ago was of Dickens's late novels and including his traveling inkwell, which I deeply coveted. And, um, um, and I think it was our mutual friend actually, which happened around the time of his great train crash and he's having this kind of, you know, secret affair. And his handwriting is really quite small. His manuscript writing is, is really quite small and he's so sort of angry with himself for committing 
crude solecisms and so on. There's huge amounts, like kind of madman has gone over the mm -hmm. manuscript and scratched in, in kind of angry Carolingian minuscule, the version yeah. which then becomes the book. So it is, like, it is an expressionist thing, you know, it is kind yeah. of leaving the process visible, actually. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I find text... it very, sorry, I was just going to say no. I find it very reassuring because I am a, a constant editor, but obviously I use a laptop, so my edits aren't, you know, seen. And, you know, you, you read these great novelists and great writers and great academics right. that I, you know, aspire to write like, and you think, oh, how does it just come so effortlessly out of their head? And then you see a Dickens <laughs> manuscript and you think, okay, it wasn't effortless, don't worry. You know, I don't know. No, that's right. <laughs> the, so... the big subtext behind all this is, is something the romantics are very preoccupied with, I think Jerry Coe particularly. Um, mm. And that's the, you know, there was a sort of sense, and this is a huge issue in, in, all of art history into our own time is the legacy of classicism essentially you know mm -hmm. and if you if you kind of equate what art is with the premises of classicism maybe redefined by alberti and practitioners like raphael um then you're going to be, then you're essentially going to believe that editing um is an essential process but editing in in the cause of beauty in the cause of finesse um because mm -hmm. ultimately if you go back to plato then what art is about is the kind of visible expression of the abstract idea so that what mm -hmm. art cannot be is unedited coarseness of any kind or it can't you can't ever leave your maniera sitting on the face of the work yeah uh, ever you know it's a shocking thing yeah. arrogant disgraceful thing and of course, the one great heretic who said, I certainly can, uh, is Michelangelo, particularly late Michelangelo, whether in sculpture or in um, uh, The Last Judgment in particular. And, you know, where Michelangelo is on the edge of mannerism himself, um, and he just doesn't give a toss. And um, so it's not surprising that Michelangelo is, you know, Blake's hero, he's everybody's hero. And he's, he's yeah. over idealized as some sort of rebel against the excessive finesse and polish and, as we'd say, licked but finish I wonder, I, of yeah. classicism. I wonder if this is in some ways a feature of age, you know, of great masters aging, because his, you know, because he worked on David, you know, months. So, you know, his early... Yeah, well, for sure. Stuff, no, he was working uh, yeah, on for, sure. you know, months and months. And then it was that slow release of... And, and, and I think you yeah, said well, that I a did, lot of I did, that, you know, that release. I did, I did a series of lectures, the Mellon lectures, which I never published because um, uh, yeah, there's a particular reason why, but I, I really should, pardon, I should be brave enough to publish them, except I actually lost the manuscript for one of them, but I can redo it. It's called Really Old Masters, which is about late style. And it was about late style in art. Uh, it be actually began with the, the, the full length nudes of Lucian Freud, including the one where he presents himself. Mm. Have you noticed, you know, the one with the shoes and he's totally nude, but he, yeah. he also being so modest, presents himself in the attitude of the Apollo Belvedere <laughs> but, but yeah. holding a kind of palette knife. I mean, it's so grandiose, it's comical. <laughs> so I, I go from there to the relationship, which you know about, you know, from, because you're kind enough to read that, the relationship in memory that Rembrandt had with Titian and particularly with late Titian mm -hmm. and Rembrandt, you know, reproductive prints were happening, but I don't know, nobody was reproducing the flaying of Marcius or, um, you know, so I, it's, it's unclear how much a kind of radical deconstruction of surface that Titian was into really registered with. And there was one lecture on Goya and David, both in our old age, and one on Picasso mm -hmm. and Matisse. And then actually the last one I was going to do was going to be about de Kooning and Miro. And um, I'm not actually a great fan of those late ribbon like de Kooning's but they are very extraordinary mm. and they happen when he's losing his mental grip whereas do you know those late Miro's which are um, yeah they look much more like Lucio Fontana's but Miro was doing slashed monochromes which yeah. are you know well, there was so... that fantastic Miro retrospective or uh, you know when I was a, in my late teens I remember going to a tape a yeah tape did they have those there? Seeing them, yeah they did yeah and they are shocking, aren't they, really? Because mm -hmm. they're kind of enraged images of damage, you know. They're not like mm -hmm. 
Mr. Charming light surrealism at all, the infuriated <laughs> pictures. And, and at the time of the uprisings of the 60s, which he had mixed feelings about, um, he did even more kind of torn graffiti like things mm. which i don't know if they had those and yeah. well I, I was also, i was re yeah i was recently in 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 palma in mallorca which has the great miro uh, museum yeah. and studio i don't know if you've if you've ever been to that I haven't. there's one and, in barcelona which is nice but yeah. yeah and there's i mean miro spent his oh the palma you know, the last... is the studio that's been reconstructed right exactly it is his yeah there are the two studio. studios there's the old house up on the hill and then there's yes. that beautiful oh the architecture of mate foundation um, i have to go yeah i can't remember yeah. the name but um anyway yeah. yes so it's <laughs> that a lot of a lot of his stuff is there and what you also get there still in the old house you know his second studio on that site are his scrawlings all over the walls and he yeah. would just you know, you scroll and create these very kind of automatic you know uh sculptures that he would just shapes that he would sort of bring in from the outside and right. this whole coded right. images anyway so it, it, it ties in with what you were saying but it's yeah. uh I yeah think, fantastic you know, the, to, go. to go back to the you know the the romantics themselves you know they all mm. do go through um academic training um and yeah. um you know uh, they have their roman moments you know jerico does and and they know that the kind of <laughs> the Fons Ederico of neoclassicism, David, you know, was made by his period in Rome. But they have this kind of, um, they have this kind of restive relationship with the obligations of academic training. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, you know, something I didn't say, because it it's too confusing in a way. Uh, there's a huge amount, particularly of Michelangelo's classicism in Jericho's Rough to the Medusa, aren't mm -hmm. they? You have this kind of enormous, yeah. these are not people who are starving to death or are about to, you know, eat each other. They are heroic bodies, really, thrown mm -hmm. together. And indeed, the great kind of mass of figures, you yeah. know, forms well, so the classical pyramid. Also, kind of Lyacon kind of sprawl. Yeah, Some of the exactly. Along the, yeah, it, 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 exactly. And yet they, they see within the classical tradition um, what you might call kind of creative hyperbole, you know. And that interestingly goes back, you know, one of the founding documents from romanticism that we don't talk about, um, but you know well, I'm sure, is Burke's inquiry into um, uh, the sublime and the uh, sublime and the beautiful, I think it's called. Yes, isn't it? 1756, philosophical inquiry. And no reason why you should have read that, but it's, uh, it's very boring to read. Okay, good, because uh, I have. <laughs> because it's, you know, it, it's, it's an analysis of the, re the, the works on rhetoric by the Roman poet and um, orator Longinus, in which okay. Longinus describes, right. it's, it's, it, it's sort of fantastic because uh, Longinus describes the necessity of terror and horror and of the manipulation of extreme emotions if mm. you want your kind of flabby post perandial Roman senators to pay attention to anything you're saying. Yeah. And the 18th century use of the word horrid as um, something you should absolutely pursue um, in landscape, yeah. for example, the terror of precipices comes out of that, you know, dry document. And Burke thought That's of his a, own is oratory. That back to sort of Aristotle and like catharsis and yes, and exactly, part okay. of that. exactly, I mean, exactly, exactly. Long exactly. I mean, their their enemy is kind of Augustan smoothness, you know, yeah. in the way Blake's enemy is Joshua Reynolds. Anything that is kind of polite. <laughs> refined, over-edited, ingratiating, mm. uh, that's the enemy. You know, that's yeah. why Blake famously scribbles in the margins of his copy of Reynolds' uh, Discourses on Art, this man was born to depress <laughs> arts. <laughs> he hates, it's so interesting, he hates, uh, it's worth reading, there is a, um, a published edition actually of, of um, of the Reynolds discourses with all of, and the, there's an appendix hey. with, with Blake's infuriated commentary. And um, Blake hated Reynolds above all for persecuting, as he thought he did, um, um, Barry. Um, and, um, you know, Barry who attempted to be a history painter and lived in terrible poverty. And Blake sort of unfairly thinks Reynolds was out to get Barry, actually. And so he, <laughs> as we properly say, romanticizes Barry, 
you know, just as Linnell and Samuel Palmer romanticised, but with more substance to it, Blake in, in yeah. his old age. So each of them creates this yeah. image of the nobly suffering, overlooked artist. Well, and this is something, I mean, nostalgia, at the, you know, in, the, in this sort of mystique yeah. of like, nostalgia and looking back, is right. something that is sort of at the heart of, of a lot of romanticism and a lot of what you talk about, whether it's, you know, this nostalgia for your childhood or nostalgia for the past, yeah. you know, of your country and the sort of a past greatness. And obviously, I mean, even as I'm saying it, I'm thinking, oh, gosh, you know, Make America Great Again, it, it, it ties in with the nostalgia that we all have right, right now about, or not yeah. we all, um, but, but certain people have about, yeah. about times past. And, you know, how do you get back to that? How do you you know, find that. And that's, again, I mean, coming back to the, the series, that is something that, that I think it, that nostalgia comes up at the beginning of the nationalism, ep you know, episode, yeah, it does. Front, yeah. which I think is really yeah, it, well, it was fantastic. done based, a yeah. clinical condition, rather. The, the term was coined by a Swiss doctor called Johannes Hofer in his PhD treatise, um, deliberately, you know, bringing together two words, nostos, and the desire to return home, and mm. Algia, you know, migraine, basically. <laughs> <It's a laughs> terrible panic, because as a Swiss, he'd noticed that Swiss mercenaries, whether they were working for the Pope or the King of France, were dropping like flies because they were longing for the Alpine pasture, <laughs> and the Alpine valleys. And so this lengthy treatise was written and he said, it's actually no joke, folks. You know, they can actually, it, your respiratory system suffers, um, your heart undergoes palpitations, you know. Um, either you send these people back to, you know, the the land of lactose um, and, uh, and alpine horns, um, or you keep them away from any memory of you know, the music in particular of their mm -hmm. homeland. And I, so romanticism thrives on a sense of loss, what I call the romance of defeat, really. That's true, you know, of the kind of enthusiasm of the so-called lost cause in the South still, that even though um, it was a long time ago, the sort of sense you're still defending the Confederate flag and you're mm -hmm. defending the American way of life in the South. It's an enormous part. So it thrives on this sense of something that's being taken from you, really, which is kind of not, you know, Brussels bureaucrats take, took something from you. Um, it, all those sorts of things are, are mean that actually your sense of grievance is more important than your sense of optimism, really. Yeah. Um, so we'll see which has the stronger hand in a month or so in America. Oh, yeah, gosh. Yeah. No, exactly. And, and yeah. No, it did did it did make me think throughout watching it, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of even just turns of phrase that you use that feel so yeah. immediate you're talking about these romantics, but that, you know, touch on on phrases that we're constantly hearing hearing today. So Yeah, well we you know, end up the whole series, every side of the of As the you art. know, in the proms actually, which we had no idea yeah. that there's going to be a controversy <laughs> about you know, Land of Hope and Glory and Royal Britannia and all the rest of them. We yeah, and all the EU flags. By some, <laughs> well, by some serendipitous piece of in, instinct, it's Jerusalem which begins and ends that film as well. In fact, yeah. we, end, we end the series and that last film with, with Beethoven, you know, and people say, oh, well, he's going to sign off with the European anthem. Good, you know. I sign off as Schiller. That seems to me good company. Yeah, no, definitely. Oh well, I feel like we've we've got to the forty-five minutes time. We've actually got gone gone over. There is Goodness. so much sort of to to discuss. It's it's flown by. Um, but this this series is really fantastic. I think. And, Thank you. And the conversation has just been so wonderful to expand on. You know things that weren't able to be touched on, but also just to you know hear yes. why, you know why you wanted to make this right now. You know, and and, uh, yeah. and why it is so important. So thank you so much. Uh, for taking the, the time pleasure. to Thank me. you for asking me. It's been, yeah, a real pleasure. And, and I hope you have an amazing rest of the day. I suppose it's only noon where you are, so you've got a lot more of the day. Um, it is. And, Lunch yeah. and then a bit of writing with any luck, yeah. Sounds yeah. great. I look forward to reading whatever that is. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for watching. All right. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Simon. Bye.